Hi, I'm David Colosso. I'm a graduate student here at the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh. Now, in collaboration with the Hillman Library and the Center for Philosophy of Science, we'll be looking at some of the interesting artifacts in the Archives of Scientific Philosophy. Let's go to the archives. Today I'll be meeting with my friend Dr. Joshua Eisenthal. Together we'll be talking about logical positivism, Wittgenstein's Tractatus, and the attempts by the Vienna Circle to tally up their views. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Eisenthal. Thank you very much. Uh, just call me Josh. Josh. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your research and uh, what you, you brought here uh, for us to look at today? Sure. Uh, so I've just completed my dissertation here at Pitt in the philosophy department, and I was writing about the influence of the physicist Heinrich Hertz on the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. Um, so my research is about, uh, at least in that project, how although their work looks really different from each other, in fact they're both interested in the same overarching theme. So they're both interested in a perspective from which certain puzzles, certain problems seem to demand an answer, a solution. Um, and drawing us, their reader, to a different perspective where that puzzle or problem just doesn't arise in the first place. Um, and Wittgenstein uh, was a key influence on the members of the Vienna Circle, which will bring us to uh, what we have here today. And so the members of the Vienna Circle picked up that theme from Wittgenstein in the following way, at least some members did. Uh, they took Wittgenstein to be providing a way of demarcating different domains of discourse. So on the one hand, you would have legitimate scientific factual discourse. On the other hand, you'd have metaphysical or philosophical discourse that they wanted to say was illegitimate and to be condemned as nonsense. So uh, this is from the Vienna Circle, a, a group of, of philosophers, a lot of influence. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about them and how it leads to them uh, somehow tallying up their views? Yeah, for sure. So. Uh, this is turn of the century Vienna, this is one of the uh, intellectual and cultural capitals in the entire world at that time. Um, and there were lots of different circles, uh, which were just groups of thinkers who would come together, perhaps in a coffee shop, to discuss some group of topics at the time. Uh, so the Vienna Circle, as it came to be known, was a group um, constituted by perhaps the major philosophically oriented scientists and mathematicians. and scientifically oriented philosophers of that period um, who had come together uh, to discuss certain works. Uh, in particular, they were hugely influenced by the Tractatus, um, which was published a little bit earlier, sort of just in the early stages, formative stages. Um, and almost no one understood it or knew what to make of it. Um, in fact, Wittgenstein almost struggled to publish it at all. But when the Vienna Circle picked it up, um, they immediately regarded it as hugely important. So important that they read through it together line by line. Um, and uh, in fact, seemed to have voted on uh, some of the major themes that they picked up from that work, uh, which we see here uh, in practice. So that strikes me as a little weird. Uh, they're just voting on it? I mean, I, I, philosophical intellectual collaboration is really interesting. Um, but you know, what's going on here? Where did they, they, they pull these propositions from Wittgenstein and they just literally tally up their positions on them? What's going on? So it at least looks like something like that's happening. So what we have here, uh, we have the development of the theses of the Vienna Circle, um, recorded by Rose Rand, who herself was uh, a younger member of the Vienna Circle who took minutes some of the time. And then we have uh, six of the members, key members of the circle, Schlick, Weissmann, Carnap, Neurath, Hahn, and Kaufmann. And they're recording with different colors whether they agree, ya ja, in blue, disagree, nine in red, or uh, nonsense, sinlos, senseless, um, with these numbered propositions down the left-hand side. So you can see here, they've got an initial for each of their names, and then they've colored in whether they agree or disagree or think it's meaningless uh, three times before they've read the Tractatus, during the time that they're reading the Tractatus, it seems, and then after they finish the Tractatus. So this really documents uh, how central the Tractatus was to these thinkers at this time. And they seem to be tracking uh, whether they agree with each other, disagree with each other, and how their views might change as they come to work through this text. 
some of these propositions here are um, sort of directly from the Tractatus unambiguously. So, for example, uh, Proposition 3 says uh, language pictures reality. So this is clearly a reference to the picture theory of meaning in the Tractatus, as it's been come to be known. Other propositions, it seems like the Vienna Circle are developing their own ideas. It's less clear how closely connected it is to the Tractatus. So uh, Proposition 7, uh, the meaning of a sentence is its method of verification. So this is the uh, verificationist theory of meaning that is associated with logical positivism, which many of, the, many of these figures were founding figures in that movement. But it's less clear that that's um, a major theme in the Tractatus. So it's really interesting, um, and, and we're seeing some kind of development here. Um, you know, when I think of doing archival research, you know, taking something out of the archive, I think about, you know, beyond public, ma uh, you know, published manuscripts, we want to be able to look at, you know, unpublished works, notebooks, things like that. This seems like entirely different, an entirely different approach to understanding how we get from something like Wittgenstein's Tractatus to the logical positivism of the 20th century. Uh, what, what can we learn from something like this that you know, we wouldn't really see if we just read the Aufbau or even some kind of unpublished work? Yeah, so I completely agree. Um, this seems to me to be perhaps a unique artifact in the history of philosophy. I certainly haven't seen anything like this before. Um, and what this offers is a sort of peek behind the curtain into the messy, organic process of doing philosophy. Philosophy is a sort of live activity, and in particular how that's uh, interactions between different people, conversations that happen behind the scenes. We're not seeing the final product, we're not seeing the polished uh, tip of the iceberg, which hides all the work that went into it. We're seeing some of the process um, that we typically don't see. It's also interesting because um, it brings up certain questions about archival materials themselves. Certain questions I have about this, um, did they collaboratively do this all together? Did Rose Rand interview them individually and fill it in herself? Did Rose Rand work through the minutes and come up with this as a sort of summary document? Certain questions that this invites me to want to explore a bit deeper. Thank you very much. Thank you.